we're going to do things a little bit different this time. I know I've been a big pro proponent of using Atom. Now I am going to encourage you to give Visual Studio Code or VS Code a try because it seems to have some pretty good performance features, a great development community, and works pretty slick and doesn't seem to have the same memory hangups that we sometimes experience working in Atom. So you'll want to go hunt down the Visual Studio Code download page and download the version that is going to work with your operating system. Once you have that installed, there will be two extensions that we will want to add to this to increase the functionality. And we can get to the extensions by clicking on the little icon on the left hand side after we launch Visual Studio Code. And I've added two extensions here, Live Server and Beautify. So I find that those two are going to serve us well. We may add others as we keep working, but for right now, those are outstanding extensions to work with. Now, when we want to use those extensions, we can get to them if we don't know the commands for them under the View Command Palette. And then we see the different options of commands that we can do. And you can just start typing in what you're looking for. So if you type in Live, it shows that we are able to pull up the Live server. If I want to Beautify, we will see there is Beautify so that I can apply that to my document. So again, we're able to get to there by going under View, pulling up the Command Palette, or Command Shift P or Control Shift P will bring it up for us as well. So that's the first part about getting started. So now when I'm in VS Code, this is going to be, so I opened up a directory or folder, and now I wish to add a file to this. So the file that I'm going to add, I will just click on the new file icon and type in index.html. And then that document is now waiting for me to start putting some stuff into it. So I will start typing htm and I can see the thing I want is html5 down here. And when I select that, it auto populates my page so I'm in good shape, ready to go. And I will title this Phaser Hello World so that we can see it function. Now I will hit save because I made it the index file. Oh, and VS Code is nice. It does give us some nice kind of hints as or reference to what's going on. I just scroll over something and it gives me that MDN reference element, so that's pretty nice. So the index file, because I've opened this directory, when I pull up live server, it will then launch that as the primary file. If it was not called index, then it would give me a directory listing, and I could then click on the index file to then open it. So again, Command Shift P. If I go open with live server, and now here we have it running. It shows the title over here, Phaser Hello World. I already had the server running, so I just refreshed it to make it go live. You can see that the server is running at our local server address, 127.0.0.1, colon, and then using port 5500. So title is there. The page is here. It's ready to go to see how this is working. If I were to just put in a paragraph and go, check this this out hit save switch over we'll see it's automatically updated and ready to go we don't need to put this paragraph in our page so I will delete it we will be putting something else there instead now that we have Visual Studio Code downloaded installed and up and running live server running so we can see how that's working now we're going to talk about phaser. So phaser is what we're going to start with as we begin working on the games. So we can download aspects of phaser. What we're going to do for today's activity is 
just link to the phaser script library. We're not going to download a copy yet. We'll be downloading resources and other things later. But right now we're just going to begin with that. So I'm gonna pull back up my hello world. Okay, so with it deleted, now we're going to add in our script information to this that will go in the head, then we will write the script for the game in the body. So what I'm going to do is it doesn't really matter which one we grab right now. Um, I'm going to go for the minimize one just because it has all the white space removed so it's smaller. So then that will work. So I've highlighted that and copied that. And now inside the head section of my document, I can now paste that in so that it will be ready to go. With that, we'll just type script and it's time to start working on our script. So let config equal, and now we have, so the config is going to be the object that we are then setting all of our game properties with. And then we're going to create a new instance of a phaser game and we'll pass to it all of these properties. So with this, we now specify what type we're going to do, and it will be a phaser dot auto. So this is going to be a long list of items that we are going to be adding to it. And it'll be a width of 800 and a height of 600. And with it, we're going to add in physics. So part of what we're doing here is we are doing a phaser hello world, not a normal hello world. So this is modeling after the demo from Phaser itself. So one thing that is really nice about Phaser is it does have physics built into it. So it has a whole physics engine, collision detection, uh, scale manager so we can make it scale to fit different screen resolutions. It has plugins people have created to allow different kinds of inputs, uh, fake joysticks on screen, etc. So it's a really versatile program. So now we set that our physics to arcade and then we're going to set the arcade gravity and the gravity is going to be a y value only so we'll just say y 200 as part of it. Now we also beyond those properties we need to designate our scenes that we are going to have. And we'll have our preload scene. And then we will also have our create scene. Now, a little bit word about, or info about scenes. We will end up having multiple scenes as we start building larger and more complex projects. We'll have title screens, we'll have game screens, game over screens, etc. So it has a whole scene manager built into it as well. This is part of the advantage of using an engine versus working everything from scratch. So if we think back to the day of working on our projects where we were coding, say, a whole state system with different states or screens inside of processing, now we have something that is going to allow us to do that without having to kind of define all the rules and parameters that go with it. So that is one of the advantages of using an engine versus doing it ourselves. So now we've created this game config. We've now pass or we've created our new instance of a phaser game. We've passed to it all of these config values. Now to see if I have any typos, I can certainly save and jump over and go look at the screen here. And let's see, line 22 is unhappy, so let's go back to line 22. 
and see. Okay, so it's looking for scene preload, but we don't have that created yet. So we will create it now. And now if I just left it here, we would probably see it now airs at line 23 because it's looking for our second scene. And notice the scene is simply a function. So we have this preload function and then I will have a create function. Uh, preload, create, and then there's a third one that is used when we're building games and that's update. This particular one, we're not going to have to worry about it too much, but uh, there are other ones where we will uh, have update because then we are updating what is happening to the objects inside our different scenes. So now if I save this and jump over here, we'll see it comes up, it loads an empty thing. We now can look here and we see where there's no more error messages. We have this little confirmation from Phaser that we're running version 3.24.1. So it's pretty awesome that we're able to create something like that that easily. So we've set a size, we've applied gravity. Now we don't have any objects or anything else occurring in the scene. So that is something that we need to put into it now. So to put things into it, what we're going to do is we're going to load assets. And the assets we're going to load, we'll be grabbing them out of the phaser repositories. We're not going to grab from our local, but we certainly could. So to make it easier to do that, we will say this dot load set base URL and then we specify what is the URL we're working with and it'll be phaser labs or labs dot phaser dot IO. So that gives us a base URL that we can work with. And then we get to say this dot load dot image. And when we're using this, we're doing it so that it becomes within the context of the object that is calling it. So that is why we're using it. So when we use the word this in JavaScript code, we're using it to attach something to the context of the parent object or the container object that is going to be referencing that element. So in this case, the word this is referring to the game. So what we're really saying is game, set your base URL to labsphaser.io, and then we're telling the game to load an image. And then the image, we give it a reference name to use so that we can then reference it later on in other parts of our code. And then we now need to complete the URL of where that item is going to be located. So I've now loaded this image. So preload is where we load our sounds, we load our images, our sprite sheets, any of the assets that we're going to need inside our game. Now I can say this dot add image and I specify an X location, Y location, and you'll notice that's exactly half of where things are. Objects by default will register on their middle. So then we put the middle of the object to the middle of the screen. This image happens to be 800 by 600 in size, so then that centers it perfectly on screen, and then we will put in that sky image. Now if I save this and jump over there, we see that the sky has indeed been loaded. With the sky loaded, it's time to add in the logo. So in this dot load image, this time it will be the logo and it will be at assets and sprites phaser three dash logo dot png and similar to what we did before can go let logo 
equal this dot physics dot add dot image and we will put that one at 400 100 and we'll call it logo so you'll notice that this is a little bit different than the previous one for the background the background is a static element it's decorative it's not interactive it doesn't need to do anything except exist and because of that we simply add it to the game object itself we don't need a reference to it because we will never call it again once it's loaded it's loaded and we're done but the logo is going to move and animate on the screen so with that we want to do some stuff to it so that the logo does that because we didn't add the logo to the game but we added the logo to the physics so the physics are the controller engine inside the game so we've added the logo to that so now the physics engine is going to be looking for that logo and we'll see now it's waiting for us to do some other things here thus we're getting some error messages so we're gonna have to keep adding a few more items as part of this turns out when I'm coding by myself I do sometimes make typos and that realizes it. so the actual reason I have the error is it says it can't read the property add of undefined and if I go back into my code and I start trying to look at well why can't I add it to the physics I look up at physics here and go maybe something's wrong in physics and we have an, a card instead of arcade so due to sloppy fingers and typing arcade in incorrectly it did not work so I changed it to arcade which if I had an audience and I was coding live in front of people someone probably would have stopped me and said uh, you misspelled arcade and I'd say oh I'm embarrassed now but thanks for catching that this way I had to fail and figure it out on my own extra eyes are useful and now we can see the physics are applied and it falls and goes off screen but what we're able to do when we work with the physics inside of um, phaser is we can set a few properties so I can set the velocity and I'll set it to 100 200 and then I'm going to set my bounds and all of these values when you put them in they're like knobs and dials or switches that you put in a number you try it and go I wonder what happens if I change this to a different number does that impact what is happening in my program to get a sense of how these values work we can also look up the documentation and doing that is exceptionally helpful because it allows us to then find how it's defined world bounds so all of those are camel cased so when we're typing set collide world bounds and now if we save this and jump back over If we save this and jump back over to it, if we save this and jump back over into the browser, we'll see that it had a little bit of horizontal movement as well as the vertical. To begin and now when it hits the world it keeps bouncing we can also see how it keeps bouncing forever because we set bounce horizontally and vertically to be one so that means it's perfectly elastic it never loses any energy while that bounce is happening 
So if we want to change things, so if we comment out set velocity and let's see what happens here, we'll now see it falls and it's going to keep falling, bouncing, and it will be exactly the same every time because set bounce is one. Now let's set it to zero and see what happens. You can see now zero means no bounce. So if we go 0 0.5, we get to see it fall, bounce. So each time it bounces a little bit less until it comes to rest. So when you're building your own games, you're going to change some of these values. You will play with these as you work on bounce. Now you can also see how set velocity, it gave it an impulse. It gave it an impulse 100 horizontal and 200 vertical to start before gravity could take a hold. That allowed it to then start bouncing around and hit all four edges of the screen. But when bounce is set to one and one, it then keeps going forever and ever. So we're going to put that back to one just for now. We will return that velocity and see how it then bounces. Whoop, uh, looks like we, oh, set bounce to 12. So it gained energy. Whoops. Uh, so not only did it have extra energy, it kept multiplying each time. So anything greater than one, and every time it hits something, it's going to bounce harder and faster, which is, again, something you could factor in your game. But you saw how it created that strobing thing. That's probably not good. Next, I'm going to add in a particle. And this will be a fuzzy particle. It's red in color. And it'll be, well, oh, forgot my uh, quotes there, assets and particles. And it will be the red PNG. So we now have a red particle that we are going to be able to work with as part of this. So I am going to say let, but when we have one particle, we probably want more than one. So we'll say particles is this dot add particles. And the one we will add to it is the red one. So in essence, when we create a group of particles, so something to keep in mind is phaser knows that we want to do a lot of things. So when we want to work with sprite sheets, it will understand that we can pass that in very easily. And when we're working with static sprites versus sprite sheets, animated sprites, all of that, it understands it. Particles, same thing. So we don't have to design everything from the ground up, which is really useful. Now we're going to create an emitter. So emitter is essentially like a machine that is going to just keep spewing out particles. And it's again baked into phaser. So we don't have to hand code the emitter. We don't have to hand code that we have a group of particles. We can say, yeah, I just want a bunch of particles. And be like, all right, what do you want to be your particle? Well, we told it we want it to be the red one. We want our particles to have a speed of 100. And then I will set the scale of the particle so that when it begins, it will have a scale of one, but when the particle ends, it will have a scale of zero. So this means the particle, when it comes into life, will start out big and then it will shrink down to nothing. And we will set the blend mode of the particle and blend modes are just like using blend modes inside of Photoshop or Illustrator or even CSS blend modes now where we're able to do the same color mixing between layers and we will use add for creating an additive blend as part of it. Now um, I also realize it's underlining this in red telling, whoop, 
too fast, telling me that uh, I probably have something wrong. That's one of the nice things about Visual Studio Code is it does kind of auto-checking of both HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So it's always looking for something that could be an error. And it's telling you, it's like, um, yeah, you might want to pay attention to this. So we can see blend mode string, expected comma. And when I look here, so I have the curly brace to curly brace. The curly brace means I now am creating a set of value key pairs that go into this. So I now have these different properties and values, property value. Each property and value is separated by a comma. So sometimes when you're doing this, it's easy to forget. Now we see that that went away. We can save this, jump over to our page, and now I can see right away the error on line 46. It says part of C's is not defined. So let's go back on line 46 and forgot particles, not particles. Save that. Go over here and now we can see the particles are beautiful, but they're living up in that top left corner. We need to position this particle somewhere. Well, again, using a game engine like this, where it has things built into it, I can say emitter start follow the logo. So we now are going to have the emitter. And this is part of why we set the logo up as an object, also so that we could reference it for physics. And the emitter we set as an object. We didn't just add the emitter. We didn't say, you know, uh, this dot, but we created a variable or object reference to it. So when we're doing coding, we always want to minimize the number of objects that we create. If we don't have to make something an object to store a reference to it, we try to avoid that. But if we need to be able to reference something later, having that variable reference to it using var, let, or const is going to allow us to make it happen. Now we can see that the flaming particles are attached to the logo. Now they're currently in front of the logo so maybe, let's see if we can do something about that. So we added the logo, then we added the particles and particle emitter. JavaScript, like other programming languages, executes in line order. So we added the logo to our scene, and then we added the particles. That's why the particles are sitting on top. So what we can do is I can now select my particles information here and I will just cut that and paste it in over here this would be a great time command shift P and now I can pull up beautify and look at that cleaned it up nicely fixed my indenting now I could have done it where I then use command and square brackets to move things over line by line or chunk and chunk, but it was a nice opportunity to demonstrate Beautify. So now, if we save this and jump over here, we'll see that the burning particles are existing behind the phaser logo graphic. To further demonstrate that, we can very easily manipulate things. If I go and grab a different resource out of here, so maybe I grab the blue particle, we'll see that now the particle look has changed. Or if I grab the yellow particle. So never be afraid to experiment while you are working on this. Grab the green, green is kind of fun, but now if I try something like purple, we'll see that I get all these little green boxes. So that tells me that it's trying to show the particles and that's kind of fun because we can see what the particles are, but we can see that it's not able to find it and it's even giving us an error message saying, uh, yeah, that failed, try again. So then we will grab something else. I'm gonna go back to the red because I just think the red has the real nice look to it while it's moving around on screen.